All right, today's episode of the Game Podcast, we're back on track with a good Monday episode with an outstanding guest. Uh, he's becoming a friend of mine, Hakeem Vallis. He is a former NFL player, played for multiple teams that we'll talk about. Also a real estate investor. He's in the cannabis space. He owns some great land prospects. He owns real estate all over the country. He owns a media company, and he's really making a name for himself, especially on TikTok. Whereas if you're listening to this and you think that TikTok is just kids dancing, you absolutely need to listen to this episode because you have it all wrong, and you'll see why it's one of the biggest things you should be focusing on right now. Uh, and he talks about building up on LinkedIn, building up on TikTok, and a whole bunch of other things we will jump into. But first and foremost, if you are looking to get into real estate, go to nicknicknick.com. If you go to nicknicknick.com, you'll see different ways to get involved with me, and you can get our free ebook, which is a little bit of money on Amazon, but it's free if you go through our website, and it's a quick, easy read. Uh, it'll tell you some things you need to focus on if you are an investor, whether you're new or experienced, some things you should have your finger on to gauge how the coronavirus has affected the real estate market. So go to that site, get the free ebook, it'll give you things to pay attention to now, tell you what's changed, what hasn't changed and what things you need to be paying attention to moving forward to make sure that you do not make mistakes or lose money. It's very important to be educated on what's happening and make sure you're taking calculated risks. Also, if you go to nicknicknick.com slash links, You'll see all the ways to connect with me on social media and all the different ways to subscribe to this podcast. So please, if you are listening to it and you're just streaming it, please make sure you're downloading it or you're hitting the subscribe button. It really helps a lot. Um, so you can reach us all there. Uh, more importantly, if you're looking to get involved in real estate, we have more deals coming along the pipeline. We are selling more properties than ever. We have a whole bunch of stuff going on. So if you want to buy properties from me, whether they're rentals, whether they're fix and flips, whether they're development deals, whether you want multifamily or mobile home parks, Message me or contact me through nicknicknick.com slash links any way you choose. And we could talk about getting on a conversation to figure out how to get you involved in real estate. Again, whether it's buying properties from me, selling properties to me, or figuring out a way to partner together on some deals. Or if you just don't even know what to do or where to start, we can figure that out too. But let's start getting you going, getting some assets under your belt, getting some money in your pocket, getting you a greater rate of return and start making moves instead of sitting on the sidelines. Very, very important. So Lastly, before we get going, um, Hakeem also did a great webinar on how to use LinkedIn and TikTok to build your brand and build your business. If you missed it, I have a replay of it. You just need to message me. You can go on Instagram at Nick Lamagna Invest, or you can email me podcast at nicknicknick.com or any of the ways on nicknicknick.com slash links, but reach out to me and say, hey, can I please get the replay of the free one hour podcast that Hakeem did on how to build your business and your brand using TikTok and social media. It's free. You can only get it if you contact me. So I'll send it over to you free of charge. So this episode's a great one. We cover tons of different topics. One, obviously real estate investing. We talk about mindset from somebody who was a professional NFL player. That guy has discipline. He's got an athlete's mindset. He knows what adversity is. He knows how to play against the odds, focus on a goal and achieve it. So we would talk about a lot of really good tips and tricks on how to stay focused on a goal and how to not get sidetracked or how to not get discouraged by the people around you telling you that you can't hit your dreams or by looking around and seeing all the other competition and thinking, man, how am I going to compete with these guys? Maybe they have something I don't. So whether you're the guy who's sitting there on social media watching people practice jujitsu and you're saying, well, I couldn't beat that guy or that guy's better than me, or you're watching all these other guys get successful deals on real estate and you're going, well, you know, I don't have what this guy has, or if this guy's already in that market, how am I going to compete? This will teach you to get that stuff out of your head and just start making moves and it will show you that you have a chance. And, and if you're not successful, or if you're doubting yourself, it's just in your head, you're just telling yourself a story. We will talk about how to get involved in your first deals. Great ways to get in with low money down all over the country to get into cash flowing properties that you can make money right now, get into a multi-unit and not waste money on rent. So he talks about some really great strategies to do that. Even if you're a real estate agent, he talks about great ways to start to build more clients that he tells a great story about how he helped one of his realtors do 30 additional deals in one year after working with him and educating him a little bit. We'll talk about using social media. We'll talk about the athlete's mindset. We'll talk about drive. We'll talk about achievement versus fulfillment. We talk about family. We talk about support. And of course, we go into a lot of business tips and, uh, and we talk about the market. He talks about safe ways 
to get into deals, talking about multifamily versus single family, where to start, how to start, how to scale up, what he thinks is going on right now in the market. And then of course, we talk about all the different tips and tricks on how to get involved in social media, things you should be doing to grow your brand, things you should not be doing to grow your brand, which ones to focus on, which platforms and why, how often to post, how to use VAs to scale, and a whole bunch of other things. So you will get a ton out of this episode. I've listened to it two or three times already. And every time I catch something else on there. So um, definitely reach out to me and we can get you booked up. Uh, to talk to Hakeem about growing your business as well. I'd be happy to connect you. I hope you get a lot out of this episode, but go to nicknicknick.com, nicknicknick.com slash links. Let's get you into some real estate and definitely reach out for that webinar and we will get you linked up. I appreciate Hakeem. He's a great dude. Easy guy to talk to. Dropped a ton of value and has been very generous with his time. Definitely check him out. Um, there's links to all the ways to connect with him on the show notes, but definitely follow him on TikTok, follow him on LinkedIn. Um, let's make some money. Let's make some moves. Let's make some relationships. Have a great day. It's going to be a great week. Thank you. Welcome to the A-Game Podcast with Nick LaMagna, digging into the minds and experiences of some of today's brightest entrepreneurs in real estate and business, along with Hollywood stars, UFC fighters, and your favorite rock bands. People that have figured out how to overcome obstacles, take chances, live boldly, and no matter what they do, they always bring their A-game. My guest today on the A-Game Podcast is a former NFL player, owner of Perspective Global Media. He helps brands leverage TikTok and LinkedIn. He's a real estate investor, a capital raiser. He owns a cannabis farm in Michigan, and he's the host of the Don't Sleep on TikTok podcast, as well as a proud father. Thank you for being on the A-Game Podcast today, Hakeem Velez. Nick, really, really appreciate you having me on the show, my friend. You have quite the resume there. I was like, uh, usually I only have one or two bullets I have to remember. And I was like, man, you do so many different things. I want to make sure I capture all of them. So, so uh, I'm excited, man. The biggest thing uh, with you is I, I'm trying to make sure I can split the time between all the different things that we can talk about. I've been listening to you on a lot of other podcasts, man. And you just have such a, a wide ver- array of things that you can go into and speak on for a long period of time. Um, but just we'll get into a bunch of different things. Can you give people just a quick 30,000 foot view of kind of who you are and where, where you're at today? Hundred uh, percent. First off, appreciate the introduction, Nick. Um, a little bit more about myself is it's kind of just been a journey grounded in being an entrepreneur and an athlete. Um, you know, I grew up. I was that kid in middle school who was selling Skittles um, in the back of the classroom. I, my niche was the purple wild berry Skittles. Um, <laughs> I was the same kid once I got to. Well, honestly, same kid in middle school from an athlete standpoint. I used to wake up at four, 4.30 in the morning to go to LA Fitness because they cut sports from our school. And I told my dad, I wanted to go to the NBA. And uh, he said, he'd take me to the gym every morning. Just, he's not going to wake me up. So I used to wake him up every morning and uh, get my shots in, get my, there's these things called jump soles that you wear under your sneakers to build your calf muscle so you could dunk earlier. So I'd get my jump soles workout in, get my shots in. And then like Around 5.30, the older guys would come in and get their pickup in, and I would you know, get a game in a pickup or so before I had to run and catch the bus. Um, and then as I grew up, going from high school to college, I was the kid with the iPhone repair business. You know, I fixed three to four phones a day when I was in college. Um, and at the same time, I got my degree was in business with a concentration in real estate. And the, the girl I was dating, her dad had a house flipping business, and we flipped around 10 houses or so up in North Jersey uh, while I was in college. And on the football field in college, you know, I was actually a bench player. My, my first three years didn't see the field. And it wasn't until my senior year, I made a move from wide receiver to tight end. Uh, and uh, first game of my senior year, I got my first catch. Second game, got my first touchdown. Started every game after that. Um, so got and got granted a fifth year, a redshirt senior year. So got two years of college ball in and was able to go uh, undrafted to the Arizona Cardinals in, in 2016 and played a three-year NFL career. And throughout that career, uh, bought properties in the markets I played in, got into the cannabis space. And after retiring, realized that I was wildly insecure um, and almost had imposter syndrome. So I, from a content standpoint, didn't put out anything. And as soon as I retired, I went balls to the wall with content and realized the opportunity that and how it could play a role in what I wanted to do uh, long term. And that was when I launched Perspective Global Media to also uh, help others do the same. 
That's awesome, man. I love that you're doing all that. It's it's so interesting. I hear that imposter syndrome come up more and more. And it's like, you know, you, you have all these accomplishments and I think everybody thinks like, when I hit this, then I'll feel a certain way. And I see more and more that people, they hit those goals and they they tend to feel unfulfilled or that there's just a missing link there. It's, it's really interesting. The mind's a crazy thing. You gotta, you gotta find, I think it's uh happy. We gotta adjust happiness and like being like our North star of success. And we have to, I like the term happiness over happy. Cause I feel like when we look for, like, when I get there, I'll be happy. When I make it to the NFL, I'll be happy. No, you'll try and go from the NFL to actually starting. And then you'll go from starting to actually getting the first touchdown. And you go from getting a touchdown to one to make your first pro ball. And you go from making your first pro ball to making your first Super Bowl. It's finding happiness along that journey and within your process of why you're eating dirt, why you're eating, you know, while you're grinding to reach those different, you know, stepping stones, I don't think they should be considered peaks. I love that. You know, it's, it's interesting to me. I'd love to hear your perspective on, first off, just the athlete mindset I, I think is, is so great. One of my favorite quotes is how you do anything is how you do everything. And I'm constantly excited to talk to people that come from that background. Like a lot of my friends are jujitsu guys or, or MMA fighters. And it's the same thing. You know, I just told a story about how a couple of them who won UFC championships after like they put the belt on and Dana White straps you around. And then there's almost a sense of like disappointment or like, you know, what do I look forward to now? And I always say that the same guys that are putting the work in to become champions or, you know, professional athletes and they're successful. If they decided to get into real estate, that same discipline of waking up early and putting the hard work in and taking the beatings and coming back the next day, that's going to carry over into business and they're going to become amazing at real estate because they have those same principles of success. The thing that you just said about constantly being, you know, somebody looking into the distance of, well, the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, do you think that's something like that you and I and an entrepreneur has, or are you finding that that's just the human mindset across the board is that they're never really present in what they're currently achieving? Uh, I think it's the, I think it's the human all the way across the board. Yes. I think entrepreneurs, high performers have that naturally. I think it's uh, what's the word? I think there's layers to it. So maybe you and I might be like, yeah, when I close on this 50 unit, then it's the 100 unit, then it's the 150 unit, then it's the full blown complex, then it's I'm starting the full blown fund. First, I'm going to start wholesaling, then I'm going to fix and flip, then I'm going to do rentals, then I'm going to do apartments, then I'm going to start a fund. I think there's a layer to that with every human with smaller things like it could be first i'm going to you know how, how do i explain i'm trying to think because i just i just heard somebody say something and i was just like it was it was so parallel to like a i wouldn't say i wouldn't compare like a lower level or a higher level thought you know like apples and oranges but i think it's more or less of we all have a hesitation with everything because it's like i got to do this before i can do this before i can do that but then i'm not going to be happy until i can do that which is it's a lot but i think it's it's finding it's, I think the, the, the core of it all is adjusting your North Star to happiness and not whether it's actual uh, objects or experiences, either or. I think it's just shifting that actual North Star to an actual thought of happiness and not something that's arbitrary. I think that's cool, man. I think that that's wise advice that everybody needs to sit back and take or, or else... You know, like Ferris Bueller always says, if you don't stop and look around every once in a while, life's going to pass you by. So I try and be conscious of that. But as far as what you do, the stuff you just said about waking up at four o'clock, getting your work at in before everybody else even comes in at 530, which is considered early to a lot of people. Is that something that you have always done? Has, has it always been easy for you to have that discipline or is that something you developed over time? For me, it's once I have a goal or something, I'm laser, laser focused. Back then it was, I'm, I'm playing at Duke University. I know I'm going, I didn't go to Duke University playing basketball. Those goals obviously adjusted and shifted. But when I have a goal, I go LeBron James, zero dark, zero dark 30 mode to get it. And it's always been like that. Even when I, you know, when I was, man, when I was in high school, I tore my labor my senior year, like in my shoulder, so I couldn't play. And the back half of my senior year, I was trying to still get ready for college ball because like I wanted to ball out in college. I wanted to go, the, I, I told you I was a bench player though my first three years, but like even senior year of high school, I, I went to boarding school for high school and there was a school about 15 minutes down the road where these trainers would come in and train some of their athletes in the morning. Cause 
one of my teammates' dad coached at that school. Long story short, these guys came in at like, they got there every day at 4.45-ish. And so we had to leave our dorms at like 4.15. We would, we would me and uh, two of my buddies, we would we'd, uh, turn the alarms off in our dorms. Like the alarms would go off because it's, you know, it's high school students, you know, leaving the, your actual dorm at 4.15 if we didn't like let the deans know beforehand. Um, but it was back then, it was, that was my goal. My North Star had shifted to make it to the NFL. Like I still have from my senior year of high school, uh, a piece of paper that when I, I did honors theater back in high school and uh, our, our teacher, she made us write letters to ourselves that I completely forgot about. But one of the questions she asked, like she pretty much prompted us like with a bunch of different questions to answer that she was gonna you know, fold up and, and mail to ourselves. What are we gonna be doing five years from now? And I said, in five years from now, I'm going to be in the NFL playing wide receiver. But I played tight end because I changed positions in college. But like, that was my goal, and nothing was going to stop me to get it. And that's that's how I I looked at it. And I think that's always kind of how it's been. But it's always started with having an end goal in mind to now reverse engineer what's going to be my process now moving forward. I love that, man. I, I love the the confidence and the mindset. The the athletic side of that, I feel like is also parallel to the real estate side where there's no guarantees. It, it, it is a lot of risk. Not everybody makes it. Did you have a lot of support from your friends and family when you initially said, I'm going to be in the NFL? Because I know a lot of people, oh, no, don't do that. You know, go get a real job. Like, you know, and, and the same question for real estate. Did you get the same naysayers going like, no, 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 that's risky. You're going to lose your money. For me. NFL was my little brother actually went to the NFL as well. So I actually had a nice little supporting cast because it already had happened. So now it was, it was more or less do people actually believe in it? Cause I wasn't that good. My little brother, <laughs> five, five star stud had a scholarship to every college in the country, went to the university of Virginia. He got drafted sixth round as a sophomore. He was 20 years old, couldn't buy a drink and was playing in the NFL. <laughs> and I, you know, from, 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 from my perspective, it was, chip on my shoulder like it was like are we allowed to curse on this podcast oh yeah you, like, you motherfuckers don't know who i am was <laughs> kind of like my my attitude going into the entire process of just it was more or less of like a just wait and see type of approach um because i was putting in the work like in the dark during during like those times and it was uh so i, I would say yes there was a supporting cast but it was it was uh I don't know how many people actually like my parents and obviously everybody close, close believed in me, but like people from afar, I don't know how much, uh, how much belief they had looking into it. And from a real estate standpoint, I had my head down. No one knew what I was doing until like, I didn't even tell my dad what I was doing from a real estate standpoint until I was already pre-approved for my FHA loan, had the property figured out. It was underwritten literally before I had submitted the offer the next day. Um, I called my dad and like told him I had all my ducks in it because like, I wanted to have all my ducks in a row. So he wasn't worried on like, oh, what are you doing? Like blah, 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 blah. I was like, no, look, I'm pre-approved. I pay this. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And he was stoked. And it was, uh, it was a cool process moving forward. And I, I didn't tell many people outside of that because I just, like I told you from a content standpoint, no one knew I was investing in real estate, buying cannabis land while I was playing. I, I except my close peers on that, that I played with, because I would bring them over the house and I would show them what I was doing. Um, give them like, I, my, my, I always had like an extensive library of books. I would always be like the book guy. So everybody would come and grab a book or two and then come back in two weeks, drop it off and grab another one, which was kind of cool. Awesome. And I definitely want to hear about the first deal, but you reminded me of something with, uh, with reading. So I know you said you, you do a lot of reading and I know initially when you were doing this, you had long training days and you had to sneak it in where you can, how do you juggle? Are you doing more audible books now? Are you actually still sitting down and reading? Like, do you have a monthly goal of how many books or how many pages? For me lately, I haven't been doing that well. Back when I was training, I was big on the audio side. Um, I would, man, I, I used to only listen to the Bigger Pockets podcast back in 2015, 2016, and every book that each guest recommended, I would then download that book to, to listen to it. Um, then I got to a place of when I was outside of the pandemic, when I traveled so much, I got all my books in when I was traveling, when I was just on planes, on planes and just on the road like that, I would, I'd get a book or two in just on like a trip. Um, and then now lately I've been so balls to the wall with what like, today was actually it's crazy. You say that today was the day I was considering reading 10 pages in this book called Sapiens uh, that I have over there. Um, but it's uh, I'm trying to get back. I don't, are you familiar with 75 hard? 
Yeah. So I, I've made it to like, man, I made it to day 20, day 18, day nine, like so many different days where I screwed up and had to go back down. Um, but I finally just went, my parents were just in town for a week and they helped me on the meal prep side. Um, so now I've got the diet side taken care of and with 75 hard is also reading 10 pages a day. So I'm going to, um, about to get back into that and starting and lightly with the, the 10 pages a day. Um, with me, it's just been, when I look at my Google calendar, it's damn near every minute is filled in. So it's, it's hard. It's super hard. And then having the two-year-old on top of that, like obviously excuses, 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 but <laughs> it's, uh, if, if I was up to me, I would wake up at four in the morning every day right now, but I can't with, with my daughter because she will usually cry around then. And then I have to lay in bed with her from then until she's like up, up. And it's like, I can't sneak out of bed, get like a morning <laughs> routine and get, you know what I'm saying? Like, it would be super nice and dandy if I could get everything up, you know, in before the sun rose, but it's not happening. Yeah. You don't seem like a guy who makes many excuses. So I'm sure it's tough, but I kind of do the same thing, man. I, I slacked for a little bit. I just picked up like, uh, what if you can see this, the, the magic lamp, it's goal setting for people who hate setting goals. And I like then, that. Uh, and then I got rocket fuel and I just happened here and I was like, I'm just going to go back to the good too, right? Yeah. Cause you know, it, it's, I guess it's like a, an offshoot of traction, which is a great book, but traction, like I'll, I'll have to read it over and over again. And then, I'll, you know, it's, it, it's complicated. Whereas this is supposed to be a little bit of, I think uh, an easier read with a lot of the same highlights. So have you I, read the one thing I have? I liked it. Actually, I think that's the most recent book I finished. I like the one thing on, I like, I like it specifically for like reverse engineering something like I got, I got this goal, but how do I simplify it so I can bring it to what I need to do today. So in six months, I can put my first offer in on a property or something of that sort. I love that part of it. And that, that first page literally just changed every day. I have to tell myself chase two rabbits, catch none. Cause I'm constantly like sitting here trying to focus on like, what should I be doing? What's the best use of my time? I have to do this. Now I have to do that. For a guy who's juggling all these different things, how do you stay focused and prioritize your day? For me, uh, this is the best piece of advice from from Gary Vee that he puts it in his content a lot, is not judging myself. Um, I've got a lot of balls in the air, um, but I'm not afraid if, you know, 50 balls in the air, if 20 drop, I still got 30 in the air. Whereas most people live life with one ball in the air, putting all the defense in place so that one ball doesn't drop and has the same level of anxiety that I have. And it's <laughs> like, uh, for me, I'm the most, I wouldn't be happy if I had only one ball in the air. I'd be itching all day. So I, I do all the things that I want to do, try and put the people in place and the, and the, and the, the teams in place. So it actually can actually work. And, you know, not too many balls are falling on itself, making sure I can keep my head above water um, at the end of the day. And then just be in a place of like, okay, you lost a client. Don't judge yourself. Okay. This idea was awesome, but we can't execute it on in the next six months. There's no shot, but I'm not going to judge myself. Even though you made a post that you're going to do X, Y, Z started a podcast, uh, all the different podcasts that we, we mentioned <laughs> before the show started. That's like, yeah, I've you search and search. Hake anyone who's listened to this search Hakeem Vallis in the podcast bar and you'll see the podcast that I've started and then stop. But like, I don't care. I'll stop. If I want to do it again, I'll do it again. But I'm, you'll probably spend more energy thinking about it than I will, if that makes sense. Yeah, fair enough. I like that, man. I like that you have a good set of sense of what works for you. You know what I mean? Cause just cause the, uh, you know, one person might only like, like you said, setting the defense up and having that one thing in the air. But I think it's really important to be aware of, of what works for you and what keeps you calm. Cause I ask that question a lot for people of how do you find balance? And I love some of the people are like, my balance is being busy all day long and like having no balance, like just cause that doesn't make you feel good. Doesn't mean that that's how I should be. So I think that that's very wise words and very good advice. And, you know, uh, parlaying that now into, into your deal. I know you said you lined up everything prior for your first deal before you went and you told your dad about what you were doing. You mentioned FHA talk a little bit about what your first deal was jumping into real estate investing. So my first deal was, uh, was a fourplex. So got, pre-approved. Uh, I was in Phoenix. So I was playing for the Arizona Cardinals at the time. Um, lived, used to live in Tempe, Arizona. I was paying like two grand a month. Knew I was going to pay $24,000 that year towards air at the end of the day. Um, and I had read Brandon Turner's book on, I think, rental property investing. And he'd mentioned that, he mentioned the FHA loan strategy. I, and I had read it way prior, but I'd, I'd never heard of it again. And after I was paying that rent, I'm like, bro, I'm not about to 
to keep paying this rent. And I'm like, I feel like he mentioned some type of strategy in that book. Went back to my notes and sure enough, it was FHA loan was right there and put out a post on Bigger Pockets to the, the local threads, you know, saying who's interested, who, who looking to network with other investors in the Tempe area who are, who have house hacked or in multifamily. I can't remember exactly what it said and took a whole bunch of people out to coffee, found a great investor realtor. And essentially we found a $268,000 fourplex that was about a, about a 45 minute to 50 minute commute into work every day. But literally the only thing that was going to work in my price range, but it was in a, still a great neighborhood um, out, out in North Phoenix. And with the FHA loan allows you to put down three and a half percent. So I put down 13,000. It's a little bit more than three and a half percent on that fourplex, which was less than the 24,000 I was going to spend on rent. And with that, my mortgage was 1700 bucks a month. Um, I lived in one unit, rented out the other three and was able to live for free when I was with the Cardinals. I think that's amazing, man. I think it's a very underutilized strategy too. It, it amazes me. The more we learn about this business, you assume that people know what you know. And the FHA loans and the house hacking and things like that. But I'll have calls average, with people every day that don't know. They have no idea what that is. Your average real estate agent doesn't even know. Yeah. And like that could be their biggest selling tool, in my opinion. Like when you're trying to sell to millennials, like your average person wants to be in real estate, wants to be an investor, wants to wear that badge on their chest that I'm an investor. It would be wise to let people know instead of buying your first home of putting three and a half percent down on this retail property, because most, you know, some realtors are just trying to get that commission, move on, commission, move on. It'd be wise to let that person know that, oh, if you, I don't know if you know this as well. You can also buy an apartment <laughs> building for the same amount of money you're about to put down on this house, where now it could also be an investment property where your mortgage will be for free. I might not make as much on commission because maybe it's cheaper than this $500,000 house that you want to buy, but this is going to get your, your, the, the ball rolling. My, my, my realtor who sold me my fourplex, I was the first person he did it with. He did 36 more in the next two years. Nice. And it's like, I feel like a lot are missing that on like their belt. And it's like, man, I feel like, like, cause people don't know if you just spent all of your time instead of putting out, you know, for sales sold as content all day and actually just educated people on the FHA loan is the most powerful strategy for getting into real estate. Work with me. <laughs> I agree with that. And I, I'm even looking at stuff around here that I'm going, you know what? Even if I look at a fourplex and I leave one of the units vacant as just for a year so I can go in with three and a half percent down, it would still cash flow. And then I could just kick somebody into the next year and move back uh, out. Like there's so many ninja ways to put that together. I put out a video on TikTok that got a lot of views. I got a lot of flack from a lot of people. <laughs> but I was like, in the history of FHA loan, you're not going to get foreclosed on if you don't live there as long as you're paying your mortgage. No one is going to come knocking on your door keep your retain the mailing address for a year i tell people to just airbnb that unit like until unless you like i tell people figure out your favorite city get a fourplex there leave a unit vacant for you and airbnb it when you're not there because it's just the the lowest way to get into real estate and if you're about to get married or if you're engaged because once you're married you only get one fha loan as a couple i tell you before if you are in a serious relationship and you guys think you might might you know tie the knot the easiest way for you guys to get a step up in just life is you guys now buying eight units as a couple, Airbnb being one of the units, living in the other unit on the other fourplex and doing that until you get married and then get your first starter house from the profits that you've you know, pulled in from, from the years of investing. Or it's not even investing, it's over, over, over underwrite. You know, make sure you budget for property managers and all that and just live, just be an owner in that sense. But I think it's, wildly wise if you're in a serious relationship to get eight units before you get married because it's the you there's no other way to do it in that in that sense obviously there's other ways to do it there's no other low low uh low point of entry way to do it i think that that's you just fired me up to just go pick like two i'm like i'm gonna call a brandon turner and tell him to find me a fourplex in maui <laughs> <laughs> it's real it's 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 real it's uh it's 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 a the strategy people should consider because with Airbnb, you can just, okay, I know I'm going to, I'm going to vacation in April. I'm going to go in June. I'm going to go in May. I'm going to go in August and September. And then every time else, I'm just going to Airbnb it. And now for those weeks, I'm going to be there. It's going to be booked. I love that, man. I think that's awesome. So starting out with fourplexes, it, from what I, I was able to find, I might not have caught it in a different interview, but did you ever really get into 
prior to working with your um your ex girlfriend, but once you really started rocking and rolling on that, did you do the single family thing? Because it looks like most of your your business now is multifamily, right? No, no, no singles. Uh, the duplex was the closest to a single, but no, I, I had a duplex when I played in Detroit with the Lions. I don't. So I'm not a fan. I'm a fan of different. singles, but I'm not a. I'm not a not a fan of singles. Like, if if I'm if I'm in the single world, the only time I'm, I would even consider. Ah, Cause I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm always, I'm an open-minded investor at the end of the day. Um, right now during the pandemic, I think the, it's hard to invest a lot. It depends on where you're making your money on what part of the process, depending on if it's larger properties or smaller properties. I actually like the wholesaling space. I've never been a fan of the wholesaling space, been a more or less of a fan of it right now. If you've got the tactics team and scalability in place. Um, and it's cause it's more or less more, more or less the most risk-free way right now with, all things considered with everything that's up in the air right now. Uh, outside of that, I like the fix and flip space in the for, with the right person, the right experienced person who's actually done it, has been through a crash, knows how to, okay, has a back end plan of this fix doesn't work. We're going to turn it into a rental because X, Y, and Z versus I just like the scalability of, of multifamily and the, the economies of scale. I, I love multifamily. And I think right now, all the guys that I knew, I was I was in single family before the market crashed. So I feel good about having a pulse and being being excited and seeing an opportunity, but not being like trigger happy and just going and and making un uncalculated risky decisions. But a lot of the guys that I know that I talked to that were in multifamily before the crash that held assets that were in like, you know, C plus C B areas, they didn't feel that hit. And that cash flow carried them all the way through the recession. So I do like in an uncertain time, investing in those middle income to lower middle income multifamily assets. I, I think it's a really safe bet. It's just the only thing that's hard that where I, the only place where I get worried some is just with the 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 more moratoriums in, the, yes. in some of these markets where it's like the, the the renters are getting looked out for, but some of there's in some of those markets, there's not, you still got to pay your mortgage at the end of the day. Or if you're seller financing, you still got to pay that, that, that note to, to that seller that's carrying, carrying that note. Um, and that's where it just gets to an interesting place. Like six months with no rent can get, can, depending on what your reserves look like, can, that can be some fire to your feet. And I think, uh, how do I explain it? Um, it's hard because it's, it's, what you're seeing in these large, large markets like in New York and like in LA, one, they're splitting rent in half, which now they're just you're barely breaking even. But then on top of that, I, what I'm seeing is some of them are doing, you know, six to eight months free just so I can get you in the door, then have the premium rent on the back end. But it's just like, man, like you're now you're just playing, I'm playing catch up on a balance sheet so I can satisfy my investors at the end of the day. So I, I that's where it's like, I don't have the stomach to deal with that right now. If that makes <laughs> sense. Um, so I'd rather go balls to the wall, do what I know how to do right now on the media side to build a massive nest egg of capital because the the it the rug hasn't been pulled. Like historically, when you're looking at peaks and dips and peaks and dips and peaks and dips, like we haven't dipped in real estate yet. So it's like historically, re pandemic or no pandemic, there should be a dip coming soon. And it hasn't. So when the rug actually gets pulled, he who has the gold makes the rules or has the money or the cash is going to be the ones who make the rules. Banks, we used to say banks aren't going anywhere, but mm, <laughs> you're not as confident as that anymore with, with people. So I think it's, it's whoever has cash and whoever has land at the end of the day, as the future plays itself out, is who's going to win. Ever wanted to play the drums? Or do you want to get your kids some drum lessons to burn some of that energy while they are all locked up? Take advantage of a free drum lesson with one of the tri-state area's most respected drummers, Dan LaMagna. Dan LaMagna has played in such bands as Crown of Thorns, Suicide City, Biohazard, The Real McKenzie's, Sworn Enemy, The Walls of Jericho. He's played all over the world and he's also endorsed by such companies as DW, Vader, and Sabian. Dan has taught tons of people from all different age groups and all different music styles. He can teach adults, kids, advanced, beginner, any types of styles from metal, all different types of percussion, whatever style you want. Get a free drum lesson today from Dan. All you need to do is text the word drummer, D-R-U-M-M-E-R, to 833-632-8888. 
800-633-0585. Again, text the word DRUMMER, D-R-U-M-M-E-R, to the number 833-632-0585 for your free online drum lesson. No, I think that that's very smart. And, th- and there is that that variable that those guys didn't have. They didn't have a pandemic last time. And I thought it was interesting because everybody was screaming from the rooftops that were overdue for a market correction. And then the pandemic happened and we thought that was what was going to happen. And then people were upset. And I was like, but this is what everybody wanted. They said prices were too high, income wasn't growing, values were, and now you're getting that and now it's a bad thing. But it is interesting. And that's why I, I do like the idea of wholesaling because like you said, it's risk-free. And right now, there's low inventory in a lot of these areas. Lenders are still lending and buyers are still buying. So, you know, there, there's there's some good money to be made still. And I a thousand percent agree with I'm constantly trying to educate my investors and say, hey, like we're, we're keeping the money going right now while it's good, but it's so we can do something really big with it when it's not good. So make sure that, and I had a couple that had called me and said, hey, you know what? Like we're looking to pull our money out. And I said, okay, well, what are you going to do with it? And then when they start to say what their ideas are and you look over like, the stress, the headaches, the, the the risk that goes in and what the actual return would be versus you get a call from me once a year and look how much money you're making and I'm going to be the one to put it in a safe place after. I think raising money and educating to prepare for the crash when you can really double, triple, quadruple, probably even more with that same amount of money is exciting. That's real. That's totally real. I love that. So I, I thought what your answer was on the Bigger Pockets podcast when you said that right now, kind of sitting on the sidelines, I thought it was very honest. It was refreshing because it's something that I, I don't hear a lot. But, you know, I, I think it's it's another good reason why you're diversifying, going through all these different things. But when you were talking about the different areas that you had your, your properties in, I know you played for different places and you go and you speak in different places. But aside from that, I know there was stuff in like Iowa and then there was stuff in Michigan. And how do you pick your markets of where you want to really hold some properties? Markets for me is two factors. One, it's data. And then two, it's uh, people. Uh, people being who, who, like the actual energy of the people that are there once I touch boots on the ground. And then two, who am I actually partnering with in that market? You know, there's, there's, there's industries, which you can call, Gary Veeam says it best, he calls industries or niches horses, and then there's jockeys, the actual individuals. And I think I, I'd rather bet on the jockey over the horse. Um, so from a partnership standpoint, it's partnering with the right people. And then from a market standpoint, it's I, I'm big on data, so I, I'm a I'm a math nerd. So I, when I was playing, I used I literally had a demographer would get the market data that I needed for specific markets when I didn't have the time to actually. I want these specific parameters. Give me the top fifty, and then now take those top fifty and actually now call the the tax assessor, call the redevelopment office, call all these different offices to, to one, figure out what's going on in this market to, you know, hear some back into it. And then now call every broker, not every broker, but five to six or seven brokers in that market to get a real understanding of what it, what are, what cap rates are properties actually trading at in this market? What is exciting? What scares you about this market? What brokers are like antsy and like kind of pushing you off versus what brokers are like, want your money right now and are trying to send you a deck before you even get off the phone. Mm-hmm. Um, and taking all of those into account and then kind of going from there. That's cool. I like that. I, I've, I've always been interested in, in the different markets. And, you know, I, I thought there was always a miss for people just, well, I just invest where I live. Like, yeah, that's cool. But there's also a lot of other opportunities. And like you said, you know, you diversify because some of these cities right now, like uh, I had something in Ohio and for them to be able in that particular city to evict it wasn't that hard. Like, you know, the tenants and the property managers were telling me they're going, I don't know, you know, because of COVID, I can't get them out. And I'm calling up the courts and they're like, no, you can definitely get them out. They still have to show up. They have to have a ton of documentation that most of them are never going to go through the, the process to actually get. They have to have like doctors, like all these different things to show that COVID is literally the reason why they cannot pay their rent. And then even at that point, if they do, the village would actually give them money to pay you as long as they're basically doing anything but just refusing to pay. So it, it's pretty cool to to just pick up these different strategies in these different areas. And just a markets it. might not be a markets on the back end of this. Yeah, 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 for sure. So pivoting now, um, I definitely want to talk about TikTok, but I do want to ask about your podcast too, because right before you and I started recording, 
you talked about your preference for just having like organic conversations. And I agree. And I'm always interested to see how people do stuff because I'll set up just some talking points in case I get somebody who is just like pulling teeth to get answers from. So I know that I'll have just the guideline, but I rarely get to probably a quarter of the questions that I actually plan on asking because it triggers natural conversation, which, which I like. So I've debated sometimes, like maybe I should be the guy sending people questions and I just don't do it. But uh, when you and I had talked about uh, getting involved in, in helping with the media side of it, you did mention like all the work that goes into doing a podcast and prepping for a podcast and post-production for a podcast. And then you wind up not doing just the stuff that you initially loved doing. So for you, um, talk about why you started your podcast and your thoughts on, on some of the work that goes in. And I don't know if that's something you guys are helping with now too, with your media company. Yeah. So we, we do help um, others as well. Um, Man, I had a long conversation actually right before this uh, with someone who's who's doing a podcast because I think podcasting can serve so many different reasons. Like one is building an audience, but two is building the the internal IP of the network from your actual listeners. I think most people drop the ball with the people that they actually interview because you have a friend now, but you've got uh, for like a one month to two month window post interview to keep that relationship warm and then continue to keep it warm as the years continue to go on and you deciding what you want to do with that IP of that network as you grow it, you know, over time. Um, but from a podcast standpoint, I think, I think podcasts are critical. I think it's so important. I, I think they're more important than people think. Cause I think people think that podcasts are dead. I think they're wildly underrated. Um, specifically off of the point that everyone has a story and no one's listening. And when you're the person who provides a platform for someone to tell their story on, that can be your initial value add to any relationship out there. Most people are, you try to figure out how do I bring value to this person? How do I bring value to that person? How do I bring value to this person? Having a podcast, believe it or not, although you're getting a ridiculous amount of wisdom, depending on who the guest is, although you're feel like you're getting that person's time depending on the show obviously too and the and the guests obviously there's levels to it like Gary V is probably not going to come on most podcasts hey, but serendipitously he will but uh that's your initial give and people miss out on that point but on the back end post production side i look at it a couple ways you know from tricks and hacks and what we actually do like with our team and with our own podcast is we have an internal podcast called Don't Sleep on TikTok uh, at Perspective Global Media. Essentially, as a TikTok consulting agency, I don't want to be the only person screaming my thoughts on what's working. I'd rather also post-produce content from some of the best creators on the platform as well on what their best tips of what's working for them. Because here's the results, not only that I've had as a former NFL player, but has that, that this commercial real estate broker has had that lives in Denver, that this private equity fund uh, manager has had in California, that this financial advisor has had in Arizona, that, the, you know what I'm saying? Like all these different stories, but then post-produce in hundreds of different ways to communicate that on the back end on all across all platforms. How we do it is, is uh, my co-host, who's also, she runs business development for my company. She goes back through our episodes and first, Technically, the interns first go and timestamp it, and then she goes back and she essentially goes through and adds her creative thoughts on what that could be turned into a piece of content. So this one minute clip of us talking about how I bought my fourplex, for example, can now, how do we turn that into a TikTok video? She might write, we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and that's what we'll post natively to our prospective global media TikTok account. Or what's my best five tips about TikTok? And I say this, that, this, that, and that. Now turning that into a LinkedIn carousel post versus anything else, but she's going to strategize for that. And then the rest of the team will execute on that being turned into a piece of content. But we'll essentially, like how our process process goes, she listens to it or interns listen to it. She goes back, checks them out, turns those into content, not turns them into content, turns them into ideas. Me and her will then strategize over a call and like she'll just pitch them all out. Like, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? What do you think about this? And kind of getting more and more comfortable as the process becomes more and more fluid. That makes sense. Yeah, it makes total sense, man. I, I think that's awesome. And your, you, your basic talk with me when we first connected the other day, you really got my wheels turning and had me starting to look at those different things because I do take the time to go through all the episodes and pull the clips and stamp them and put the captions on there. But I realized that I was putting a lot of time in and I wasn't using the content that I already had to maximize what I should be doing with it and make it the most efficient. And you really started throwing out some data with me, which 
I'd say over the last five or six years, I've become a data nerd too. I didn't realize I was, but it's the most important thing. It's so amazing. And you started having a lot of facts and figures and statistics to back up all the things that you were saying, which I thought was awesome. You know, it was like, take all the emotion out. Your per- perception or most people's perception on what TikTok is, is my nieces and nephews doing silly dances all day. What they're not seeing is that the data is telling you it's not that at all. It's all these other things that people aren't seeing yet. And because they don't know that yet means there's still an opportunity. So I'd love to just nerd out on TikTok for like the next 15 minutes and just start to hear you talk about like why TikTok and what the data is and why it's important. 100 percent. I mean, with 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 TikTok, like with anything you want to accomplish, you need attention at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, as as entrepreneurs, as go getters, we're as content creators, the internet is only one infinite flowing stream of attention, but we're all fighting over that same stream. And with fighting over that same stream comes distribution platforms of where that, you know, attention is being distributed. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Parler, Clubhouse. There's so many. It started with just Face, MySpace, then Facebook, then Facebook and Vine, then Facebook, Vine, Instagram, Facebook, Vine, and like Snapchat, like there's going to be millions as we go on. It's only been a solid 10 years of social media mixed with the convenience of a cell phone. Like MySpace existed before that 10 years, but that was from a desktop. Now the convenience of social media from a cell phone has completely exponentially increased the capabilities of people being able to create platforms from the desk of their own homes. And we're not even at the infant stage yet. Which is why, which is where I don't think people are woke in that standpoint. As we continue to grow and our this one stream of attention is completely, 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 completely divided across hundreds of platforms, it's going to be hard to actually create your own community, your own tribe, your own group of people who like, trust, and respect you and want to hear what you have to say. And as we exponentially get older and older and older, these younger kids, the only thing they care about right now is to become an influencer and the clout of having a blue check mark and having followers. Like, we didn't care about those things growing up. We adapted to it. The fact that this is what they care about, like there's going to be a lot more fish in the sea that are going to be able to beat you. Back to like I, we mentioned David versus Goliath. The only way David be- beats Goliath is by acting like David. The only reason why companies like, you know, Blockbuster, like, borders, like all these old tried and true companies. And I think there's going to be way more than we actually really think or understand or know that are going to go out of business because we're not utilizing the, 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 the new age version of where attention is actually going. Like the hundreds of thousands of dollars that people still spend on billboards, the hundreds of thousands of dollars that people still spend on TV commercials, the hundreds of thousands of dollars that people still spend on, you know, the, the, the the newspaper ad in the back or whatever wh- wherever that isn't actually converting in that sense it's it's over one it's overpriced two tiktok and other platforms where the organic reaches through the roof it's free and the fact that it's free people need to be taking this more serious than they took when they were 16 and it was time to get their driver's license like we're not i don't think we're 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 truly respecting the gravity of the opportunity that's at hand and the, the, what's the word? The simple fact that brand is transferable back in September, when it was looking like TikTok was going away, people were like, Oh, I'm not getting on TikTok. It's going to go away. So you can't grow a hundred thousand person community and bring them to Instagram or to YouTube or an email list or whatever. Are you not bringing that audience enough value to want them to do that? Maybe that's a completely different conversation. Um, At the end of the day, brands transferable. Vine was only around for two years, but you've got guys like Logan Paul, who's set to fight Floyd Mayweather this year. You've got guys like Jake Paul who fought Nate Robinson last year. And like, that's, wild but they got big on a platform that was only around like in its heyday heyday for two years max but that's the punchline then you've got girls like charlie d'amelio who've you know cleared around 40 million in a year just on a platform like tiktok and she's 16 years old and i think uh 
the opportunity i was you know super high level but going into the, like the weeds of like why from a data standpoint you need to be there i mean 80 percent of your views are coming from people who don't follow you so I, I tell people if you have the internal capabilities to put out content at scale 10 20 30 50 videos a day you should because it's only going to help you versus hurt you if you're putting out the right type of content uh and it's 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 a real estate play at the end of the day if i could you know new york city you could buy downtown New York City real estate in the 1930s. Any and all of us would empty our bank accounts to buy as much as we could, and we'd borrow more from our parents to buy even more. This is the same opportunity, except, again, the real estate is actually free because my 250,000 followers on TikTok are going to be worth a lot more next year than they are this year. That makes sense. It makes total sense, man. I, I agree a thousand percent. And you said a couple other things that I thought were really interesting because I was trying to figure out where should I really be focusing my efforts because everybody's saying Instagram, but Instagram becomes a lot of pay to play. And what you were saying about the branding being transferable, I thought it was in interesting because you were saying, hey, if you want to build up your Instagram, build up your TikTok. You want to build up your LinkedIn, build up your TikTok. Like, And you'll see that that starts to transfer over to all those different things. And, and I forget the exact step, but the consumption time on TikTok versus the other platforms was staggering. Yeah, so the, and one, LinkedIn just saw, uh, what do you call it? I wanna make sure we're clear. I don't think that there is a, the, the uh, what's the word? The, I'm trying to think of the actual word I'm thinking of now. The transfer rate from TikTok to LinkedIn isn't really there. Okay. It's TikTok to Instagram, TikTok to YouTube. LinkedIn in its own as a platform is, wild. There's 675 million daily active users on LinkedIn, but of the 675 million, only 3 million put out content on a weekly basis. Oh. So the supply and demand gap is wild when it comes to LinkedIn. Everyone on LinkedIn is just putting my new endorsement, putting my new whatever, putting this article that my company featured the other day, I'm just going to repost it versus showing up like it was Facebook in 2010, 2011 you'll win because people will know who you are and the buying power on LinkedIn, the medium income on LinkedIn is $70,000 per user. And uh, with TikTok, because of the UI UX of the platform of how they connected YouTube and Instagram is why you can see a massive spike in followers. If you like, I see it every day. Like if I have a video that hits 50, 30, 25, as like new Instagram followers that day, because they saw my TikTok video, went to my profile, clicked my Instagram, it brought you straight to Instagram, followed me, and then you went back to TikTok because, how do I explain? It only took you four seconds versus any other platform. Most other platforms have failed on that specifically. And then when you think of, what was I gonna say, uh, consumption time, platform to platform, Facebook's daily average consumption time is 12 minutes a day. Instagram's daily average consumption time is 25 minutes a day, where TikTok is 85 minutes a day. Like the data is telling you where the attention is, but people are still posting on Facebook and Instagram where the, the pipes are essentially clogged. It's too yeah. much content for not enough attention. Whereas TikTok has a ridiculous amount of attention, not enough content. That's why my buddy Ifani Moma, he's three days on the, the, the three days on TikTok now. I don't know, maybe, I think he has under 10,000 followers on Instagram, just like me. And in his first two posts on TikTok, he's at 20,000 followers. What? Like, just like that. First video, 165,000 views. Second video, last time I checked yesterday, it was at 885,000 views. Man. Only platform you can do that because Stephen A. Smith isn't on TikTok and he doesn't own that real estate of the people who are looking for that type of content. That's amazing, man. And I know that you were saying that they're actually changing the algorithms to start to get away from the singing and dancing kids on there, right? Yeah. So TikTok as a whole felt that they were being generalized as a dancing platform and they don't want that. So they've strategically adjusted their algorithm to go away from dancing content and lean more towards informational, educational and compelling storytelling type of content. That's awesome, man. I'm, I'm in a number of um, real estate masterminds and groups of a lot of high level guys. And they are all just starting to figure out, I need to be on TikTok. And you can tell like they're uncomfortable kind of jumping in, but the interest is there. And there's still some people that I think are saying, don't do it. But they did send me over some questions to ask while I had you on. Is it okay if I, I room through a couple? Yeah, rip them. Cool, oh, awesome. Um, the, let's see, what do we got here? What are, what's a good call to action to entice engagement on TikTok? 
call to action is I always do it in my, my videos all the time. Like uh, if I'm talking about, so if we're talking, depends on what you're talking about. If you're doing your day, you're showing your day in the life, then maybe at the end of your day in the life, comment your favorite morning routine. If you're making coffee, like I'm, I love coffee. So I make coffee the other day. What's your favorite way to make coffee? Cause I was using like a mocha pot or like a, some people call it a mocha pot. Some people call it a percolator, all different types of things. Um, I've Super Bowl. Who do you think is going to win the Super Bowl? Leave it in the comments. If you want to actually test, are you touching, testing engagement? Or are you trying to call to action to actually raise money on, in your first post? So that's like, depends on what you're trying to do. But from an engagement standpoint, I always do that just to just see who's in my audience and to actually build more and 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 more community. And then you do, I I have a MailChimp uh, email list, but I don't sell them anything every week. I randomly will have my admins, uh, what do you call it? Message out a a time for the next day that I'm going to host a Zoom call where I I just do a one hour Zoom Q&A for my followers. Like anyone who's put their email in on my my MailChimp list, like in my TikTok bio gets an email. And I don't, I don't like, Months ago, it was at like 700 people on that list. So I don't know how many are on the list now, but that's the way you can test engagement, something like that, where it's just like what I'm doing in real estate once a week of a Zoom call or every month or whatever, of just updates, not like a sales pitch or anything like that, actual from an educational standpoint. That was gold right there, man. That was awesome. That's good stuff, which actually leads great into the next question was, what's the best way to use a VA to grow your follower base um, within your niche? Best way to use a VA for social within your niche, it depends, one. Two, because it's it's hard to outsource a personal brand when it's a personal brand. That's what makes it a personal brand. So I don't let anyone go in the comments on my own account because it's my account. And I want them to know it's me at the end of the day from a genuine standpoint. The best way to use a VA would be to source accounts that you maybe want to work with, be around, follow and within that sense. So essentially what I'll have my VAs do, like say people that I want to, I want to work with, or I want them to follow me back, for example. So now I've got a hundred accounts in front of me. Now, when I have, you know, 15 minutes or poop time or whatever, and I've got like on my Google sheets, I've got that list that I can just click account, follow them and actually leave value. Go to three of their posts, watch it and leave a thoughtful comment. Go to three more of their posts, watch it, and leave a thoughtful comment and not spam. But now you've got those people sourced. So I, I think from, from my standpoint, it's sourcing. It's like a VA for content is sourcing. But then on the back end, if you have a podcast, it's re-listening to your podcast and training them on what is value in your podcast in that sense. Or maybe it's just time stamping. When does each question start? Make a note in the time stamps of what you, you, you kind of get what I'm saying. Yeah, that yeah. would help because you can get a VA for such a, 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 a lower price point. And then it's, what can you teach them on the back end? I'm all about training. I love that, man. So in short, um, finishing off here, talk about how do people find you? How can they work with you? What's the best ways to contact you for, for working with you in the media and the real estate side? 100%. LinkedIn is a great place. Just Hakeem Vallis on LinkedIn. Um, anyone wants to you know, contact me, work with me in that sense, my, my email is Hakeem at PerspectiveGlobalMedia.com. Um, on my, my website, literally this morning, I just got a notification that it's down. So literally it's a fire that I have to put out today to, to figure out what, uh, mm-hmm. what went wrong on the website side. So I don't, I don't want to put a call to action for, to, to my, my website is just perspective. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be up, uh, by then. Okay, cool. And they can, they can make a consultation with you and figure out how you can help grow their brand using TikTok. hundred percent. Awesome, man. I'm definitely going to push that out. And I know there's a bunch of people that have already reached out to me that are very interested in connecting with you. So um, final thought before I let you go, if you could give advice to a younger you starting out now, which you know about life and business, what advice would you give a younger Hakeem today? Slow down and open your eyes. Because I'm heads down so much and so into the grind that, you know, sometimes you need to breathe and look out the window, you know what I'm saying? And, 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 And soak it in for a second and not with modern technology, we're going to live to 120. And with that being 28 years old, I mean, I'm still in the first quarter. So we still got time. So I think it's slow down um, and, and soak it in. Cause I was super intense as a young man. That makes sense. Yeah, definitely, man. Well, this has been great. I really appreciate all the time and all the help. I'm looking forward to working with you more. I know you got to go, but you gave a ton of great value today. I very much appreciate it. I will post all your links and contacts in the show notes. You bring your A game, sir. Thank you very much for your time today. 
Absolutely, brother. I enjoyed the show, man. Thanks for having me. Definitely. Thanks for coming on, man. Have a great day. You're so